Presidential Elections and Electoral College Elections decided by the House of Representatives There were just two elections in American history that were decided by the House of Representatives. In 1800, the House chose Thomas Jefferson over Aaron Burr after 36 attempts. The election was decided by the House because no candidate had a majority of Electoral College votes. Jefferson and Burr tied with 73, John Adams had 65, Charles Pinckney had 64. In 1824, the House for the second and so far the last time chose John Quincy Adams over Andrew Jackson. This was the second and last time that the House of Representatives actually chose the president. Uh, and again, like in 1800, no one had a majority of the Electoral College vote. Jackson had 99, John Quincy Adams 84, William Crawford 41, and Henry Clay 37. So in this particular election, the House chose John Quincy Adams, and uh, Jackson was obviously very disappointed. What allows the House of Representatives to choose the president if no one has a majority of the Electoral College votes? Originally, it was Article 2, Section 1, Clause 3. It states, If no person have a majority, then from the five highest on the list, the said House shall in like manner choose the president. But in choosing the president, the votes shall be taken by states, the representatives from each state having one vote. So this was applicable in deciding the election of 1800. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 3 continues. After the choice of the president, the person having the greatest number of votes of the electors shall be the vice president. But if there should remain two or more who have equal votes, the Senate shall choose from them, by ballot, the vice president. In 1804, the 12th Amendment was ratified. It provided for separate ballots for electors to choose president and vice president. It also reduced the number of candidates from 5 to 3 in cases if no such candidate carried a majority of the Electoral College vote. The 12th Amendment in part states, If no person have such majority, then from the persons having the highest numbers not exceeding 3 on the list of those voted for as president, the House of Representatives shall choose immediately by ballot the president. But in choosing the president, the votes shall be taken by states the representation from each state having one vote. The person having the greatest number of votes as vice president shall be the vice president if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. And if no person have a majority, then from the two highest numbers on the list, the Senate shall choose the vice president. So, where in the Constitution is the basis uh, for the Electoral College? That's Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2. It states, Each state shall appoint, in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct, a number of electors, equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in Congress. But no senator or representative, or person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States, shall be appointed an elector. So each state has as many electoral college votes as its congressional delegation, i.e. as the number of vo voting members that it has in the House of Representatives plus the number of senators, too, that each state has. But these electors may not themselves be members of the House of Representatives or the senators or any person uh, holding an office of trust or profit under the United States. So, who actually selects the electors? The process is controlled by the political parties in each state, and it varies from state to state. Generally, the parties either nominate slates of potential electors at their party conventions, or they choose them by a vote of the party's central committee. This happens in each state for each party, by whatever rules the state party and sometimes the national party have for this process. So this part of the process results in each presidential candidate having their own unique slate of potential electors. So each president, uh, presidential candidate on the ballot has his or her own slate of electors. Uh, can electors be controlled 
or are they free agents? And if they can be controlled, how? So the answer is yes, they can be controlled. A state can exclude or allow political parties to exclude potential electors who refuse to pledge to support the party's nominee. So uh, a pledge may in fact be required either by the party or by directly by state law for each uh, elector to vote the way that uh, the election, the popular vote turns out and vote for his or her political party's nominee for president. A state may fine an elector who refuses to vote uh, the way that the state law directs. So that is to say, as a part of the party slate of electors. This was this this, this uh, rule was upheld by the Supreme Court in Shafalo versus Washington in 2020. No elector has ever been prosecuted for failing to vote as pledged. However, several electors were disqualified and replaced, and others were fined in 2016, for example, for failing to vote as pledged. It is rare for electors to disregard the popular vote by casting their electoral vote for someone other than the party's candidate. Electors generally hold a leadership position in their party, or they were chosen to recognize years of loyal service to the party. So this is what makes them reliable. This is why they so rarely break their pledge or break with the party uh, preference and vote for someone other uh, than their party party's not a candidate. Throughout our history, as a nation, more than 99% of electors have voted as pledged. So how can the state control electors? There's no federal law that requires electors to vote as they have pledged, but 29 states and the District of Columbia have legal control over how the electors vote in the Electoral College. This means the electors are bound by state law and or by a state or party pledge to cast their vote for the candidate that wins the statewide popular vote. At the same time, this also means that there are 21 states in the Union that have no requirements uh, of or legal control over the electors. Therefore, despite the outcome of a state's popular vote, the state's electors are ultimately free to vote in whatever manner they, play, they please, including an abstention with no legal repercussions. The states uh, with legal control over the electors um, are the following 29 states. You can find those following 29 states at the uh, archives of the fairvote.org website. So faceless electors. Between 1796 and 2016, inclusive, there have been only 90 faceless electors for president. There's also been a number of them for vice president. Faceless electors have never made a difference in the outcome of an election. So how, how electoral college votes are allocated is a very important topic for everyone to understand. Each state decides exactly how to translate the popular votes for candidates into electoral college votes for those candidates. Um, all one has to do in, in all states except for Maine and Nebraska, all one has to do is to win more votes than any other candidate. So all you have to do is to win a plurality. The majority, that is to say 50 plus one, is not necessary. A plurality will suffice. So a hypothetical example could be the Republican wins 40% of the popular vote, Democrat 30%, Libertarian 20%, Green candidate 5%, Peace and Freedom 5%. So this would add up to 100. In a scenario like this, no one has the majority. No one has more than 50%. However, we do see that one candidate, the Republican candidate, has more votes than anyone else. He has a plurality of 40%. So in all states except for Maine and Nebraska, the Republican candidate would win all of that state's electoral college votes. 
Maine and Nebraska have a slightly different system. They award two electoral college votes to the winner of the overall popular vote. So in our hypothetical example, the Republican would get two electoral college votes. And the rest are allocated based on who got the plurality, who won more votes than anyone else in each congressional district. So they look at a district by district. And it may very well happen that whoever won the, the plurality of the total popular vote in Maine or Nebraska also won each congressional district. Now, winning the overall popular vote but losing in the Electoral College, I remind you that the election of 1824 was a bit unique. Andrew Jackson won the overall popular vote and he won electoral college vote, but he won a plurality and not a majority of electoral college vote, which is why the election was decided by the House of Representatives. So the House chose the loser of the popular vote and the loser of the electoral college vote, uh, John Quincy Adams, because this choice is not precluded by the Constitution of the United States. It's not precluded because, again, Andrew Jackson felt short of a majority in the Electoral College vote. So that was 1824. Then in 1876, we see that Samuel Tilden won the most popular votes. He won the popular vote. However, Rutherford Hayes won the majority of the Electoral College vote. It's an election that is controversial to this day. In the end, the bipartisan committee that had one more Republican than Democrat gave the election to Hayes, uh, and in the end, the state in question was, was the state of Florida, just as it would be again in the year 2000 in a similarly split election. So Rutherford Hayes carried the majority of the Electoral College vote in 1876 and became president, even though Samuel Tilden won uh, most uh, popular votes. Then we have in 1888, um, we saw that the popular vote winner was Grover Cleveland. However, Benjamin Harrison won the majority of the Electoral College vote and became president. In the year 2000, Al Gore won the popular vote over George W. Bush by more than half a million votes. Bush won the uh, electoral college vote. Again, like in 1876, Florida was the sticking point. And uh, when Secretary of State uh, of Florida Republican Catherine Harris decided to stop the vote count, Bush was ahead. The Supreme Court upheld the stoppage of the vote count. Thus, Bush carried the Electoral College in Florida, giving him the majority of Electoral College vote and giving him the presidency. And then in 2016, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote over Donald Trump by more than 2.8 million popular votes. But Donald Trump had a very solid victory in the Electoral College vote. He carried a significant majority of those votes. Other impact of Electoral College. So in most elections, Electoral College actually exaggerates the win of the winner. In other words, it makes it look like the winner won more decisively than his real margin of popular support. And that makes it easier for the winner to claim the mandate to move into the direction of his and eventually her choice. So most presidents, because of the Electoral College, appear to have won more decisively than their actual support in the population. And this allows them to front, and this allows them to say, well, I really have a mandate, I really have all the support, whereas in, in reality, their support may be uh, very thin. Now, most importantly, I believe, Electoral College makes general elections extremely state-centric and geographically limited because only a handful of states are competitive. Other states can be ignored. 
candidates can ignore many population centers. For example, New York, Boston, Los Angeles, Chicago, San Francisco, because in presidential elections, these major population centers are in non-battleground states, non-purple states. In the states where they are in, the election results are pretty much predetermined. So if you live in New York City, you know that New York State in the end will choose the Democrat for president. If you're in Boston, you know your state of Massachusetts will eventually go Democrat. Los Angeles or San Francisco, you know that California is going to pick Democrat for president. It has in every election since 1992. So what does this mean? This means that candidates for president in the general election, do not have, even have to go to those population centers or indeed to any place in, uh, in the states where these population centers are located. They don't have to appeal to voters in those population centers. They don't have to tell them what they want to do for them if they win. And the only way to change this would be, of course, to abolish the Electoral College. So why is it so hard to abolish the Electoral College? Because it is written into the Constitution as we have just seen. So it is Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2, and it's the 12th Amendment, which really uh, established and maintained the Electoral College. Getting rid of it would require a constitutional amendment, and as you know by now, it is extremely difficult to, to pass and then ratify a constitutional amendment. Electoral College skews presidential election power towards smaller states because uh, its way of allocating votes violates strict proportionality in favor of those smaller states. And here you see an example if we had a strictly proportional allocation of Electoral College votes, then the ratio would be 1 to 52. Uh, it's a hypothetical example, which also happens to be real. So, the least populous, populous states, like Vermont or Wyoming, they would only have one, they would have, if proportionality, strict proportionality existed, they would have one electoral college vote, whereas the most populous state, California, with nearly 39.5 million people, would only have... 52 electoral college votes. So the ratio of the smallest to the most populous would be 1 divided by 52. However, because there's an extra 2 for each state, skewing the proportionality, the actual ratio of the smallest to the most populous is 3 divided by 54. So 3 54th is greater than 1 52nd. So if you add a constant to the numerator and denominator, you skew the number. The fraction with the added constant is greater than the fraction without the added constant. And so there are many small states in the United States. Getting rid of the Electoral College is against their interest because, again, having the Electoral College gives them a little bit more power in choosing president. Therefore, it is unlikely that 38 states, which is, of course, the three-fourths that would be necessary to ratify an amendment, as you know, as per, per Article 5 of the Constitution, it is highly unlikely that 38 states will ratify an amendment to get rid of the Electoral College. All right, I think this is it. Uh, thank you for your attention.